Father God, you truly have been good and faithful and uh, just ever present for each and every one of us. And we, we just love you so much. We thank you for the great love that you give to us and show to us and have shown to us throughout the years as you sent your son to a cross uh, to, as a payment for our sin, to take the guilty charge of sin and take it upon yourself. And we're just so thankful for that. And you are amazing. And we fall short so many times of being what you've asked us to be as far as your followers. And yet you continue to be faithful even when we struggle. So we thank you for that. We pray that as we continue through this series of the fruit of the Spirit, that we will understand that <clears throat> these are all attributes that you desire and expect for us to have as your followers as your children. So we pray today that as we continue that you will just give us insight and direction and help us to know just how you would have us to live. And we thank you for all of this and we give you praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we've been doing this for a while, a number of weeks. I had someone ask me, how much longer are we doing this? We're getting close. We're getting close to the end. We'll be finishing up the first Sunday of August. So continue to have patience. And, um, but with that being said, we've, we've read this scripture over and over. And I don't want, to, don't want you to put it up quite yet, Caitlin. But how many can name the fruit of the Spirit in order? Who would be willing to do that for us? Some, you want can you want to do the fruit of the spirit? There you go. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, did you get it? Could you hear her even? Gentleness. Yep, so those, those are the weeks that we have left. Next week will be gentleness. Following week, self-control. Try to control yourself for that. We'll be ready. And then on the 5th of August, we're just going to kind of pull it all together and wrap that up. So we're looking forward to bringing that to a close. But at the same token, I want you to continue to keep these things in your mind. Again, it's, the fruit is singular. It's not plural. We've talked about love is the blossom. And the rest are parts of that and what God is desiring. You can't have peace without love. You can't have patience without love. You can't have kindness without love. Love is truly the key. So as we continue in this message, faithfulness sets us apart from other people. Faithfulness separates. The success from the failures, the finisher from the quitter, the responsible from the irresponsible, the mature from the immature, and the righteous from the sinful. Faithfulness separates those. You have grown up and are living in a society today that is unfaithful. It almost glorifies unfaithfulness in our society today. The tabloids are filled with stories of unfaithfulness. Hollywood marriages and divorces and love affairs today are even glamorized and sensationalized for everyone to see. I read a story this past week, and a true story about a former governor of New York who um, openly um, married a gay lady, and it was very open and, and in the news everywhere and they've been married for a number of years they actually have children that are now adult children well they decided that they are going to part ways but they're not going to move out of the house they're just going to continue to live there but follow their own desire so they're they're going to have this open marriage that she's going to see who she wants to see he's going to see who he wants to see and yet they're still going to stay married, they're not going to divorce, and they're going to live in the same household. And what got me about this is this whole article that was in the New York Times is talking about, isn't that just great? 
what a love story. This love story is so great. And it, and it was so, I almost want, I, I, I wanted to throw up because it so glamorized everything that is contrary to God's word. And our society is doing that today. It's glamorizing everything. It, it's desensitizing us to the fact that reality is truly the Word of God. We live in an unusual time. You even go to, you think of how society has accepted unfaithfulness. Everybody here has heard of Hallmark, right? Not the channel, but the cards. Those things that we still send out occasionally. You know, some that still write cards and send them out. When you care enough to send the best, isn't that what Hallmark is? You can find cards that fit the unfaithful lifestyle of our day. Saw one card the other day and it, it said, In love and sweetheart. That was in the section it was in. In love and sweetheart. And the card read, I can't promise you forever, but I can promise you today. If that doesn't glamorize unfaithfulness, I don't know what does. I suppose you could even put an anniversary card that says that. Um, hey dear, I'll promise you today, but I don't know about tomorrow. By the way, for thank you for everybody that did happy anniversary on Facebook. I was a little premature. You know, I, I got kind of swept up when I saw our old wedding picture and, and I thought, oh, I'm going to put that on my, my, what do you call it? On my page. Yeah, the for my, my picture, for my page, and not, not even thinking anything about it. I just like the picture, and we got hundreds of happy anniversaries. So thank you for that. Um, it is coming up. I guess I was just being nostalgic when I put it on and, and saw my beautiful wife of 44 years ago when we were just kids. And, but, so thank you for that. Our anniversary is actually Friday. Um, we're going to be away, so you know, we're going to be away Thursday, Friday, and we'll be back Saturday afternoon. So if you call and I don't answer, I'm smooching with my 44-year married wife, and uh, I'll get back with you. So. <clears throat> so thank you for that anyway. I do believe in faithfulness, by the way. I believe that it's important to stay faithful when you say that you're going to be faithful. It's important not only in a marriage, it's important in a church. As a pastor, I've been, uh, went through many, many situations where I uh, even had people tell you how committed they were, and then at the first moment of something happening, they're gone. That's not faithfulness. That's selfishness. That's an unwillingness to work through a situation. You guys know that well enough. There are many faithful here that work through a very difficult situation, and I applaud you for that because there were others that didn't remain faithful. And I understand why that happens. It happens because we get kind of, especially when something of the magnitude that happens that happened here, you get discontented with pastors, you get discontented with the church, and I understand that it's easy to walk away from that because you don't expect that in the church and I get that but yet when we're faithful we find a way to work through it but there's a stick to itiveness and I'm jumping ahead so we'll get back to that in just a minute but I'm glad God promises more than just today going back to the I'll be faithful today I can promise you today in Psalm 100 verse 5 for the Lord is good and his love endures forever his faithfulness continues what through all generations. Not just last generation or the generation before, but all generations from the time that that trumpet blows and the eastern sky splits and God calls us all home. He's faithful and He's going to continue to be faithful even after that. When it comes to faithfulness, one thing you can know for sure that God is faithful. He'll never turn His back on you even though there are times where you feel that He does. He will never abandon you, even though at times it feels like He does. 
But understand, most times when you feel like he's turned your back on you or you feel like he's abandoned you, it happens because you've turned your back on him. You begin to look at the things of the world. You begin to put down your Bible and not spend time in the Bible. You've put down having times of prayer, and, and you're actually the one that stepped away. God is faithful, but he also never forces himself on us. God's not up there trying to make a bunch of robots that just follow his every command. You know, I can't do a robot very well, I know that. But, and follow every command. He, he wants us to love him and care for him because we want to. Because we have such a deep love for him. And because that love is so deep, then we, we seek after him correctly. God will never take advantage of you, and God will never mistreat you. You have to know that. I know our society doesn't tell us that. It's trying to get us to think other than that. But God is faithful. He will never take advantage of you. He will never turn his back on you. He will always be faithful. So let me ask you, what does faithfulness mean? What word would you use to describe it? How about authenticity? How about truthfulness? How about being real? How about accurate? If you look in the dictionary, in the American Heritage Dictionary, it defines faithfulness as adhering firmly and devotedly. Adhering firmly and devotedly. Have you ever bought tape? I, I bought a big package once of black tape, electrical tape. I thought, man, this is a great deal. I think it was maybe at a flea market or something, and I'm like, man, there's, a, there's, there's like a, a monster pack of black tape, and I'll have black tape for a long time. And I remember opening that pack up and putting the, getting the first roll out, started wrapping around the wire, and it just kept following me around. It had no stickiness to it whatsoever. It, it wouldn't even stick to itself. And I wasted my money on that whole package of black tape. I cannot stand tape that doesn't stick. That's why I get Gorilla Tape. Or duct tape. You know that that's going to stick and that'll stick to anything and it'll ruin anything that you stick it to because if you try to peel it back off, it doesn't happen. But we need to be like duct tape. We need to be faithful. We need to, be, we need to have that stickiness. We need to adhere to the things of God. And so many times we're more like that tape without much glue. And, and if I can just take it and rip that off, then I can just go my way and forget all about it. And no one will know more about it. Throughout this series of the fruit of the Spirit, again, we've described each expression of love. Love is a blossom. Without love, it's impossible for the fruit to develop. The fruit of the Spirit begins and ends with love. Love is, or joy is love rejoicing. Patience is love enduring. Peace is love trusting or resting. When you can rest in God, that means you have peace. Remember the scripture that says, and the peace of God that, that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. That's, that's resting in God and having that stick to to know that even through a difficult time, he's going to see you through it. And even if we don't make it at the end on this earth, we spend eternity with him. Sometimes we look at healing, and our, our mindset of healing is, is that God fixes somebody right now. And he does that many, many times. But there are other times where taking our last breath here on this earth and moving on to eternity, that's the ultimate healing. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. And no, I'm not in a hurry to get there. I don't want it to happen tomorrow. But yet I'm ready when God's ready. Because I know he's faithful. I know he's not going to mistreat me. I know he's not going to do anything wrong. I can trust him. My favorite verse, what is it? You should know it by now. 
Trust in the Lord with all my heart. Lean not on my own understanding. In all my ways acknowledge him, and he will make my path straight, or he will direct my paths, other translations will say. Trust him in all things. Kindness is love serving. Goodness is love extending. Faithfulness is love proving. Gentleness is love touching. Self-control is love restraining. So that's this blossom of this love. Faithfulness is love proving. Faithfulness is love that hangs on to the end. It's love that won't quit. Faithfulness is not a one-time display. Faithfulness proves itself over and over again. <clears throat> Faithfulness is a lifestyle of consistent dependability. It is the superglue of the heart that won't let go. Faithfulness is the superglue of the heart that won't let go. So what does it look like? In the word of faithful, in a word, faithfulness is Jesus. Faithfulness is Jesus. If you want to see faithfulness lived out in the day-to-day -day life of someone, look at Jesus. <clears throat> if you're going to live a faithful life, then live your life like Jesus did. You say, "Well, I don't know how he lived." It's a great book. It's a bestseller still tells you all about how Jesus lived. You say, well, I don't understand it. Then find one you can understand. It's written in a lot of different ways. You say, well, it's not the King James, so it can't be right. There are people that say that. God bless them. And there may be some things that aren't exact, but what I've found in God, God can take our messed up words and still use them happens for me every Sunday morning he takes my messed up words and he uses them because I'm a mess but he's not and he's able to do that so even if you take a paraphrase read a paraphrase I've been trying to use the message a lot in here just to to give you an idea of how kind of clear and how able how you're able to kind of understand it better because it's it's just written in a language it's a little easier to understand I'm not English. I never really understood King James. I tried to understand it. There are too many these and thous and thus, and, and, and I just get, would get lost in it. And I'm not saying that that's bad, but it just didn't work for me. So I had to find something that I could get in this rusty, empty brain that would stick and work. And God, I hope, has been able to use that. So, so just find something so you can learn about who Jesus is. There are other ways to find out. We know that it's just some people's interpretation, but um, I've mentioned to you a few times as of late, I waited a long time to watch the Chosen series. And part of it was not that I had anything against it, it was just when I tried to watch the first one, I was watching TV the way I normally do. I don't have my phone up here, but normally it's watching TV and I have my phone and, and something else is going on and, and I, I just got lost in it. So I didn't watch it. I'm like, man, it's just, it's too muddied up for me. I can't, can't figure it out. Well, then I get this opportunity to go to Israel and walk where Jesus walked and all of that. And now I'm like, man, I'm interested in this again. So, so I decided I'm going to sit down. And my son told me, he said, Dad, you just, you just got to get first through the first one. But you got to pay attention. Because the way the chosen, if you've watched it, they'll start back here and then they'll jump up here. And the only way you know that is right at the beginning, down in the corner, it'll say that this happened in such and such B.C. or this happened in such and such A.D. And, and then you can say, oh, okay, this is this and this is this. So, if, so I began to watch it and really watch it. And since then, I've watched it through twice already. I'm anticipating the new one coming out in um, the first of next year. And to be able to see session, session four or um, season four, I understand there are six total. So they're halfway through and working through. If you want to see, I, I just feel that Dallas does a great job of depicting 
to me what Jesus would have been like. Just an ordinary person that's doing extraordinary things. Loves people, cares for people, cares for the sinful and the unsinful as well. So if you say, well, I don't know what Jesus is like, then we have to study. We have to seek after that. It's not just going to fall onto us by osmosis. It's not going to happen that way. So look at the life of Jesus in Hebrews 2.17. It was necessary for Jesus to be in every respect like us. So that we could be so that we could be sorry, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. We don't really have an idea of what God was like, other than we know that he's all knowing. We know all of those attributes that are non transferable to us, that he's all seeing and all knowing and all of that kind of stuff. But he sent Jesus that was born just like you and me. That grew up in a different time, but just like you and I. Like he messed his diapers. He threw up. He, he, he was a person just like us, but yet he was 100% God as well. And I believe that God did that so we could see that it's possible. It's possible to live a life like that with the help of the Holy Spirit and seeking Him. Jesus lived His life with unwavering commitment and faithfulness. He didn't quit or throw in the towel when things got hard. His love for us was steadfast and true. Jesus remained true to his commitment regardless of the cost. Jesus loved us to death and beyond. And not only did Jesus go to the cross to lay down his life for our sins, he was, the resurrection, he was resurrected to life so that we might be able to live with him. He was faithful. He stuck with it even when things got hard. There's one particular se section that I remember in the chosen Jesus miracles and all of that was starting to get uh, the Romans kind of all in a tither and and um, they're starting to watch him. And I remember at one point they're out in the wilderness and all of a sudden these Roman guards come and, and they're like, we need to take you in for questioning. And like the disciples freaked out. Like they're they're pulling their knives and they're like, and Jesus is like, Put that stuff away. It's okay. It's going to be all right. Well, how do you know it's going to be all right? How do you know? It's going to be fine. I'll be right. I'll be right back. Just let me go. And he goes, and he gets questioned, and a few hours later he comes back. He never overreacted. He never, he never got to the place of getting crazy or saying, man, no way, let's get out of here. I'm not going to go through this. We know the Garden of Gethsemane, as he goes to pray, one of the highlights of my trip was walking around. You can't walk through the garden anymore, but, but you can walk around it. It's fenced in that area where they at least believe that it was. And, and to think that Jesus knelt down possibly by that tree and cried out to God. And even though he said, hey, if there's any other way, I'm up for that. But not my will. Yours be done. I'm ready to do whatever you ask of me to do. The faithful of Je faithfulness of Jesus continues. He will never be unfaithful to us. Second Timothy three thirteen that two thirteen. Second Timothy two thirteen. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. See, Jesus is faithful and true. 
He shows us how to live faithfully. He shows us how to, ad- to adhere with firm devotion to God. To have an unbreakable stick to to one another. As I was walking around here yesterday and, and uh, I didn't have the opportunity to be here on Friday because I had to work at the funeral home. I was here Thursday evening when things were getting set up. And, and, and as a pastor, I, I quite often will just sit and watch. And I work too, but I will just sit and watch. And it's, it's such a, a treat to see the family of God working together. You know, some say, well, you know, I don't really have time to do that, or they, they surely don't need me, or if too many of us are there, then there's too many to help, and, and people just get in the way. But, but to see family gather and just work and do things, to me, actually, it's more powerful sometimes than you coming in here and listening to me ramble on for 45 minutes and, and leaving. That. that that's more powerful to me to see people just coming in and coming and going and and it's just like the doors open and I'm going to come in and do this and and coming in with cookies and goodies and oh just want to bring this in to you guys or bringing meals in and all that it's just it's a powerful picture of the faithfulness of God's people being a family and serving together you say what's it accomplished It accomplishes just that. I'm closer. I understand probably why people got upset with Jesus when he had kind of his favorite disciples and all of that, or at least it seemed like he did. But I think I've mentioned this before. The more time you spend with people, the more you know people. And bonds begin to form. And it's not like you're trying to not include other people it's just that you spent more time together. So there are times even in a church where maybe we don't feel like we're quite connected and we kind of want to blame it on the church for that and yet we're probably sometimes the one that have backed away. It's hard to build relationships when you're not serving together and being together more than on a Sunday morning. I see all your smiling faces. You're all beautiful, and everybody looks great, but I can't get to know you up here. You get to know me a little bit because I share my stories, but but I can't get to know you. I get to know you when we're out digging um, sprinkler heads, Robbie, or other things that we're messing around with outside of here. That's exactly how it happens in our relationships with Jesus. If you just come in here on Sunday mornings and listen to my stories, you say, yeah, it sounds like a pretty good guy that he talks about and knows, but but I don't really have time to read the Bible. I don't really have time to pray. I don't have time to be in church every time the church doors are open. I'm just too busy. Well, maybe the last statement needs to be looked at. I'm just too busy. When we take our last breath and we stand before Jesus and we walk up there, do we want to hear the words, can you come back another day? I I am swamped today. Like I've got so much going on. I've got so many people showing up here. There's such a line. Wake back up and come back another day. No, we don't want to hear that from Jesus because he would never say that. He's not too busy for us. You say, well, I'm not too busy for him. I'm just too busy for the things of the church. Well, that gets muddied sometimes. There is truth in that. But the reality is probably if we're not, if we're not wanting to spend a lot of time together here, then we're probably not spending a lot of time with God there. I love softball. I love baseball. And because I love softball, and because I love baseball, I'm still at the age of 60-something. I can never remember if I'm 62 or 63. But but 
I still enjoy coaching softball. I, I, I want to be around softball. I want, I, if, I, if I have the TV on, I'm watching baseball. If, I, if, if college softball is on, I'm always watching college, college softball. I love softball. But for me to stand in front of you and say I love softball, and I've never played it, I never watch it, I never go to games, I never do anything like that, then do I really love softball? But then if I turn around and say I love Jesus, but if, I've, if I never do things for people, if, I, if these, if these uh, fruits are not part of my life, then do I really love him? Do I feel distance from him because I'm distance from him? James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It doesn't say that he's going to force himself on you. It says, if I, too, if I take two steps towards God, God's going to take two steps toward me. If I take three steps toward him, he's going to take three steps toward me. If I continue to draw to him, he's going to draw to me. And that verse then even tells us how we do that. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Wash your hands of your sin... In other words, get that sin. The wash in the hands is just to symbolize that. Confess your sin. The scripture says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Your hands are washed, cleansed from all unrighteousness, but you have to go to him. So it says wash your hands of your sin and cleanse your mind of your double-mindedness. What's double-mindedness? It's saying one thing and doing another. It's saying you believe one thing and doing another. God's wanting us to draw near to him. He's faithful to come to us if we go to him. He'll call to us, Bob, hey Bob, why don't you come do this? Bob, Bob, he'll call to us, but then he wants us to take steps. And when we take steps, he'll take steps. And then he's like, hey, hey, Bob, a couple more steps closer. Come on, a little bit closer. And Bob, ah, maybe I need to take a couple steps closer. And we take steps closer, and he comes closer to us. Do we get the, the, the aspect of drawing near to God and learning his faithfulness? There's four characteristics of faithfulness. first one is the faithful hold on to truth. You need to have an unshakable tenacity that will not let go of truth. You hear what I said? You have to have an unshakable tenacity that will not let go of truth. Truth. Now we have to understand that we have not always been taught correct theology and sometimes we stand on that uncorrect theology as truth but if it's not truth it's not truth and sometimes we stand on those things instead of the truth and sometimes it's hard to know the difference opinions may change values may differ but the truth remains the same. What do we know is the truth? What do we know is the truth? We have the word of God that says that we know that one day Jesus did exist, that Jesus did walk this earth. We know that he was crucified, and we know that he rose again. History tells us that. It's there in history. It tells us in this book. There are some times, though, that we take this book and we create our own truths because of the way we interpret it, and it's not necessarily the truth. But the truth we know is that Jesus died and rose again for you and I. That is a truth that we can stand on. We can have varying opinions on other, what we would call, theological debates some of them being in our, in our society. Do you get baptized to be saved or don't you get baptized to be saved? Is it acceptable for women to be in ministry? 
or for women to pastor. Those are all hot topics in our society that we have people that stand on their truth, but is it really the truth? So you see what I'm trying to differentiate there? We know truth, but there are some things that we have our own opinions on. There are things that we even have our own convictions on. You've heard me share before. I don't listen to anything other than Christian music when it's possible for me. <clears throat> I had to listen to something other than that yesterday sitting out there because some people here like country music. So there were tears in our beer and styes in our eyes and the Ford died in the back corner and all of that stuff. I, I, I'll tolerate it, but for me... I don't listen to anything other than Christian music. But I can't stand here and say the truth is, if you li listen to anything other than Christian music, you're going to hell. That's not the truth. It should be sometimes, but it's not the truth. To go and watch some of these country music people, that they're not even country music people the way they used to be country music people. Um, and you watch your Shania, Shania Twain's and... And who's this other one that everybody's wanting to see, this girl? that um, Taylor Swift. Oh, my goodness. That's a whole other sermon. Because as much as we idolize those people, I'm getting off on a tangent. I shouldn't do this. They have their own agendas. Should I go a little bit farther? Should I go a little further? I'm talking about truth. We've got to have truth. There are things that some of these popular people that we idolize, instead of using their platform to sing and create music, they've all become political now, and they're all pushing their political views. And they're desensitizing us to the truth. I don't care how many people say, now I'm going to get probably in trouble for this, that transgenderism and all of that stuff is okay. The Bible is clear to say that there are men and women. And I'll stop with that because I could go on and preach a whole other message, but... Our society wants us to believe that truth is relative. That there is no absolute truth. It's whatever I feel, however I feel. That's why all of a sudden we can change genders, because I don't feel like a woman. I don't feel like a man. I don't feel like working sometimes, but I still have to go to work. It doesn't change that. What we feel doesn't change who we are. We still can't negate the fact that when you look around in this building, we're built two different ways. Men are built one way, women are built another way. It doesn't matter how you feel. Sorry. Not. What is it? I was going to, the address of the church. Just write to the church. Carrie can go through those notes and give them to me if she needs to, but. But do you notice the contradiction in such a belief that there is no absolute truth? How can you claim absolutes don't exist with an absolute statement? Revelations 2.25 in the message says, To the church of Thyatira, Jesus says, Hold on to the truth. Values are relative. Values will differ from person to person or even culture to culture. Truth is absolute. Truth is the same for all of us. So we need to hold on to that truth. At one time, Americans valued the wisdom of older people. We rejected those who... We rejected... Sorry, we respected those who had gone before us. However, today, we're more likely to look up to the young. 
At one time, we valued discipline and respect. Children were expected to act in a certain way. You know, if you go over into Oriental cultures today, children are still expected to behave in certain ways. And disobedience has definite consequences that we probably wouldn't even agree with and adhere to ourselves. Yet for us, discipline and respect is no longer held as an important value. Instead of teaching discipline and respect, we just have come up with diagnosis for people and we medicate them. Don't get me wrong. There are, 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 there are definitely times when people have a chemical imbalance and it has to be taken care of. But I remember our teacher calling, or one of my, our kids is Alicia, calling us into the classroom and saying that she had ADD and we needed to put her on Ritalin. I said, my daughter does not have ADD. My daughter sometimes don't know how to behave and she gets in trouble for that at home, but she also knows how to behave. So don't label her with something that isn't there. And yet, we're very quick to do that. And you may have a different opinion. God bless you. You're welcome to that. Values change, and not always for the better. Truth remains the same. If you're going to be faithful, you must hold to the truth. If we're going to be faithful to God, then we've got to hold on to the truth of, the, of His Word. There are some basic truths we should hold on, or what are some of the basic truths? So here are four more sub-points out of my first point. The Bible is authoritative, and it's a guide on how to live. 2 Timothy 3.16, another one of my favorite verses. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful in teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. God breathed. Another translation, the New Living said, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives, it straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. And then verse 17, it is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing God wants us to do. We're being equipped, we're being prepared, we're being made ready to do what he wants us to do. Jesus is the only hope for salvation. I don't care what our society says. Buddha won't save you. Muhammad won't save you. God will save you. That is the truth. That's the absolute truth. He's the only one that was put to death and came back to life. Muhammad's bones are somewhere. Buddha's bones are somewhere else. But Jesus is alive and sitting at the right hand of the Father. Salvation, Acts 4, 12. Salvation comes in no other way. No other name has been given or has been or will be given to us by which we can be saved. Jesus is the only one. So the Bible is the authoritative guide to how to live. Jesus Christ is the only hope for salvation. Number three, people are more important than things. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal where your treasure is there your heart will be also 
Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Leroy and I go back and forth on Michigan State and Michigan and all of that, and and it, it's a lot of fun just joking back and forth. But the reality of it is, yeah, if Michigan and Michigan State are playing, I would like to see Michigan win. Uh, thank you, thank you. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's a game. It's a bunch of guys running around on a football field, smacking each other around. It's really an opportunity for people that are really aggressive to get away with beating people up and not get put in jail for it. I mean, that's kind of what football is, right? But I'm not like one that's going to be like crying in the corner or burning up buildings or trashing cars and all of that at a game when Michigan doesn't win. It doesn't really matter. The fourth one, God's own everything and loans it to us for a short time. God owns everything and loans it to us for a short time. Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. We recognize that everything is His. Those that don't follow Him think that it's all theirs. And I work in the funeral business and there are times where people try to take a few things with them. Only what fits in the box. Like you, you have a limited space in the cemetery. Like the, the casket just barely fits in the vault. There's not a lot of room to put anything else in there. Your house, your car, all those other things are going to be left behind. God owns it all. The last one of those is what happens in me is more important than what happens to me. What happens in me is more important than what happens to me. Each one of us here in this room have experienced different things in our life. Devastating things. Battling cancer. Having strokes. Devastating things. And they're hard. But most times, going through those things allows something to happen in us. We either press into God or we push away. And ultimately, what happens in me is more important than what happens to me. Philippians 1.6 I'm convinced that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it through to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. What is that on the day of Jesus Christ? That's the day of his return. That's when it will be completed. The work will be taken care of then. Everything in between time is just a work that's heading to one place. I've shared with you before the situation with my dad who had serious heart attacks in February of one year and, and had paddles used on him. You know, last week we got to learn how to use the defibrillator thing here, but they literally used the paddles on him five times. When, when I saw him after all of this happened, which they did bring him back, he had his shirt off because his chest was so burnt that he couldn't even have clothes on them. And my dad was weeping. I mean, he was just, the first time I ever saw my dad cry, he's laying in bed weeping. And I, he wasn't weeping because of the pain of the burn. He was weeping because of the reality of life and the fact that it had just so quickly, it just snapped by. And yet, through the process of time, he survives that. He lives beyond that. He, but then August comes along, and as I've shared before, he's killed in an accident on the Mac Woods dune buggy rides. And, and I ask God, why? Why didn't you just take him back down? Why are we going through this again now? 
God was very clear to say that this had to happen before this happened. See, it was much more important to what happened to in my dad than what happened to my dad. All I could see is what happened to my dad, and it hurt me. It made me angry. But the reality of it was something happened in him that prepared him for the second accident and God taking him home. I know now that when he was weeping, he was making a decision in his life that God was real and that he was going to follow him and he was going to seek him. It's so much more important what happens in us than what happens to us. Romans 8, 28, For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. We have to hold to the truth. We have to persevere through difficulty. We have to persevere through difficulty. Essentially, you can make four basic responses to difficulty in your life. Only two are the right kind of responses. You can give up and be crushed. You can whine and complain. You can pray victoriously. Or you can endure and refuse to give up. What two responses would be the right kind of responses? That we can give up and be crushed? No. That we can whine and complain? Yeah. Who here likes to whine and complain? Come on, be honest. I've heard some of it. We like to whine and complain. I like to whine and complain. But that's not the right answer. We can pray victoriously and you can endure and refuse to give up. Mark 11, 23, I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. You say, well, I've told mountains to move a lot of times and they didn't move. Well, what scriptures did we just read? That God will work all things together for good. Maybe we were asking him to do something that didn't need to be done. Or maybe we were telling him to do something that he wanted to do a different way. What, you mean my way isn't the right way? Bob, is your way the right way? Most, most of the time, but not all the time. <laughs> I pray that when you have trials and difficulty, that God will give you an abundance of faith by which you can have victorious prayer. Unfortunately, when you pray and nothing happens to the mountain before you, there are some people who will say that you are unfaithful. Remember the story of a man by the name of Job? I don't understand all of it. Pastor Dan and I taught a, an Old Testament survey class, and, and you know you try to get to the depths of this stuff and figure it out, and you just don't know. What we do know is that at least a story is told about this man named Job who God and the Satan decided to have a little situation with, we'll call it. And Satan's telling God, oh, this guy, will, if he loses everything, he's turning away from you. He's not going to follow you. He's, and God says, go ahead. I give you this much room. I guarantee that he's not going to turn his back on me. So what was the first thing that his friends 
came and tried to tell him. Do you remember? What have you done wrong? What sin is there in your life that you're going through this? Because you only go through this when you do something wrong. That's the lie that's being told. And, and Job, he, he won't hear it. He doesn't want anything to do with it. There are times when things don't happen the way we want them to that we tend to look at, why are you unfaithful? Are you not walking the way you should? Now, a caveat to that, there are things that we experience in life that we experience because of wrong decisions that we've made and we want God to fix it. And God said, no, you got yourself here. Work through it. Figure it out. Draw to me. Let's figure it out together. So there are those things that happen. But other, other more catastrophic things that happen it doesn't have anything to do with us being unfaithful what does death come from there's a scripture that tells us the wages of sin is death so every week I serve this church and I get a wage. It's in a paycheck. It's what I receive for the services that I offer or provide. The wages, the payment of sin is death. We can't run away from that. We die today because of sin. Not your sin. We could take it back to Adam and Eve and their sin. That's where death started, right? So when Adam and Eve sinned, they did receive this knowledge of everything and God cast them out of the garden and now they will experience death. And we see this process through the Old Testament of people living less longer and less longer and less longer and less longer. It's that process of sin. Now you throw into it in our society today the, the desire to get ahead. So manufacturers will put things into our food or whatever else that, that is more beneficial to them and they make more money. Like if I can get a chicken from a chick to an adult in 10 days instead of 20 days, I can sell twice as many chickens. So if I put this into that chicken, then... I'm going to be able to make more. And, and most likely, I mean, when we hear the stories, oh, you eat this or this, they're putting this in it that's going to kill you. They're not wrong. We're putting things in our body every day that's killing us. And we've accepted that because that's life. And you can feel whatever your ways you want on that, but that's the reality of that. So the wage of sin is death. My struggle has always been, if it's not this that's going to kill me, it's this sin that's going to kill me. So I, I can't win. You can try to remove yourself from as much of it as you can. But sin is still going to kill you. There's part of me at times, it's like, you know, I struggle to lose weight. You see that. Like, but... I'm always thinking, what if I work my butt off, literally, and I get down to where I want to be, and this guy decides that he's going to have way more beers than he should have, and I'm going to be driving home one day, and he's going to hit me, and I'm going to be gone. I'm like, I'd rather enjoy a little bit, because I'm going to die. I mean, I'm going to die. Somewhere along the line, I'm going to die. So I make my choices. And you make your choices. And we're all going to die. Boy, that's an encouraging word to, look, to end on, isn't it? We're all going to die. But what did we start with? Faithfulness is truth. And accepting the truth and understanding it. Hebrews 11, 32-39. And what more shall I say? 
I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered judgment, justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flurry of the of the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and whose who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others had were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all committed, commended for their faith. Faithful keep their commitments. Matthew twenty five twenty one. The master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. Lives by commitment, not by feeling. Again, Jesus in the garden. Thomas Edison is 98% perspiration and 2% inspiration. The one that invented our light bulb and all of that is 98% perspiration and 2% inspiration. How many times did he fail? before he finally succeeded. Thousands? So faithful keep their commitments. And faithful faithfulness makes a fresh start. And I'll close with this, Psalm twenty or fifty one ten. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. God's just calling for us to be faithful. We need to continue to ask ourselves, am I? Am I faithful? Am I faithful when I want to be? Am I faithful when I have to be? Or am I faithful? Do I have my double-sided tape that really sticks and holds to it. Are you faithful to God? Are you faithful to the family that he's put you in, either your blood family or your Christian family? Or are you okay just kind of riding the shirt tails of others doing all of the work? God has called us to be faithful. And faithfulness is one of the fruits that we're to be producing as a child of God. Can't do it on ourselves. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit to be faithful. And we're a work in progress. You, you start a new fruit tree the first year, there's not a lot of fruit on it. And sometimes it's not really all that good. But as it begins to mature and grow, it produces more. Then you have to trim it back and get it all pruned. And then what does pruning do? It takes the dead branches off that are, that are trying to pull some of the nutrients out of the tree for themselves. And, and it's not working, so you cut them away so the other branches can get more nutrients and can do better. And that's what our Christian lives are. As we hear messages, as we read God's Word, we take those things that are, that are sapping some of our energy and we prune them away so that our, our fruit can be seen, that our love can be seen, our joy, our patience, our goodness, our kindness. You see, we wonder why I spend so much time on this. Why do we just go for so long on the same thing?
But the reality is we have to go so long so we can grasp it, so we can let it marinate, so we can let it start to, to filter in and we can become those things. This isn't Ken's rodeo. This isn't Ken's thing. I'm just doing my best to open the Word of God and give it to you and let you know this is what God requires of us. Are we going to be faithful? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the faithfulness of those that are here. I no means want to even insinuate that there is not faithfulness here because we know there is. It's been faithfulness through the years of even as we meet in this building, the faithfulness of people stacking bricks and block and pouring cement and building walls and it's faithfulness taking a burnt building and pulling a bell out of it and putting it in another building. That's faithfulness. We thank you for those that have been faithful. May we continue to be faithful and even more faithful to one another, to you, to your church, to our family. That we would truly be accurate imitators of Christ's love. You're with us now from here, Father. We thank you for just the privilege of being able to gather in this place. We just offer ourselves to you and give you praise because it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray.